Welcome, friends. We are so thankful that you are here with us today for this special series where we're presenting the secrets of amazing health and how you can be, have an abundant life and be healthier, both body, mind, and spirit. And I want to welcome those who are here at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church. We know there are a lot of people who are also watching either online or on AFTV. We welcome you as well. We encourage you to go ahead and text your friends and say if they'd like to know how they can postpone their funeral, they want to tune in right now because that is the, going to be the title of our message. Now, I'm going to be sharing a, letter, a lot of uh, information and details and some studies. We'll not have time to review all of the sources for the studies that are in the presentation, but uh, those of you who are here, uh, you'll receive one of these magazines as you leave if you don't already have one. And uh, those of you who are watching, we're going to make this available also. It's talking about uh, amazing health facts, eight Bible secrets to a longer, stronger life. Now, my sermon title, you notice, is a little different. It's talking about seven secrets to postpone your funeral. And I'd like to begin with a verse in the Bible. In the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 34, this is at the end of the writings of Moses. It says that God told Moses, you've completed your work. You cannot cross over into the promised land because he had sinned. He would be saved, but he was able to see the promised land from the top of Mount Nebo. And it says, Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. Now, this is what we want. We want to be 120 years old when we die, huh? We want to have a, a positive maximum life, maximum life expectancy. Now, think about this for a minute. The main reasons that people die, I've got seven of the leading causes of death here, heart disease, cancer, accidents, stroke, chronic lower respiratory diseases, Alzheimer's disease, and diabetes. These are some of the leading causes that people die. But how can you avoid those things? You know, right now there is a health crisis in North America. And virtually all of the health problems that they're having in North America are connected with these things. Cardiovascular disease related deaths jump from 874,000 in 2019 to 928,741 in 2020. It was the largest single year increase since 2015. And that's according to the American Heart Association's disease and stroke statistics. Obesity, the prevalence of obesity in the US in adults in 2020 was esti estimated to be 42.4%, now that's obesity and being overweight. According to the CDC, in 2021, more than seven in 10 US adults age 20 and older are either overweight or obese. That's staggering when you think about it. Being overweight or obese is linked with higher risk of getting 13 types of cancer. These cancers make up 40% of all cancers diagnosed in the United States each year. And then diabetes, World Health Organization, the number of people with diabetes in the U.S. From a, went from 108 million in 1980 to 422 million in 2014. In 2020, 10.5% of the U.S. population had diabetes. That's 34.2 million people. This cost the United States an estimated $400 billion annually. There's a lot of... Um, sparks in the news recently because the U.S. voted $2 billion for Ukraine and it says that we spend $400 billion on diabetes. It's an epidemic. Now, I'm here to tell you that the health crisis could be ended in one year. That's right. The reason there's a health crisis is not because of the insurance companies, it's not because of the equipment, it's not because of inadequate access to the medical problems. The reason there's a health crisis is there's a lot of unhealthy people. That's why. If you could cut down the number of unhealthy people by 25%, the health crisis would be over. 
the lines at the pharmacy and the emergency room and the shortage of treatment and the shortage of medicine and all these things that have turned the medical industry into a crisis is because there's so many sick people. And so much of the major cause of death and illness is related to lifestyle. We do it to ourselves. Now, you know, eventually, if you live long enough, you're going to get old and die. You all know that. But the idea is we want to die like Moses. Moses was 120 years old and he climbed a mountain and his natural force was not abated and his eye had not dimmed. That's what we want. You want to have a life where you're productive and healthy as long as possible. It used to be people worked real hard, they got old, then they died. And you know, there'd be a few weeks of illness, but now people spend 25, 30 years dying and incapacitated. And the number of handicapped parking spots in the parking lot keeps going up. Isn't that right? I know, I don't mean to be unkind or insensitive, but it's, it's true that a lot of people are killing themselves. And so I'd like to share with you some secrets on how you can postpone your funeral. So uh, what would these tips be? First of all, this is in a church, and I want you to know the principles that we're sharing with you are medically sound, but they are Bible principles. Does the Bible teach that God cares about our physical health? He does. The Bible tells us Matthew 4.23, one of my favorite verses, sort of encompasses the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds, how much? All kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Jesus, yes, he taught, he preached, but he healed all kinds of disease and all kinds of sickness. Does Jesus care about people being well? He wants us to experience health. The reason God gave us life is because he wants us to live. And when God created Adam and Eve, he put them in a garden, he intended for them to live forever. But because of the rebellion of Lucifer and Adam and Eve bought into that rebellion, sickness and death and disease have come into our world. This is not God's plan. God wants us to live. The devil is the one who brings death and sickness and disease. And if we follow the rules that God gives in his word, we can have a longer life. 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. Beloved, I pray that you might prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. God cares about soul prosperity, but he cares about physical prosperity. Jesus proved that. He wants us to be healthy. Some people think that, well, you know, you go to the doctor when you want to find out about health and you go to church when you want to find out about spiritual things. That's not accurate. The church is also a place where we should be learning about health because the principles are in the Bible. God cares about both. God promised the children of Israel that if they would serve and obey him, he would remove all sickness from them. Did he keep his promise? When he led them out of Egypt, he said, if you obey me, I'll put none of these diseases upon you that I put upon the Egyptians. And in going through the wilderness and eating the diet that God gave and getting the, the sunshine and the exercise and the clean water from the rock, the Bible tells us this is a really amazing thing because there's about two million Israelites when they cross over into the promised land, it says he brought them out and there was none feeble among his tribes. There's not, can you imagine two million people? And the the clinic there, the tent that's got the first aid clinic, it's always empty. They're, they're bored with nothing to do. Nobody's sick. That many people? It's because they were all following the plan that God had given them. So, you might want to get your camera out and just take a picture of this screen and then you can leave. Here are, I'm not going to keep you in suspense. Now I'm going to unpack it a little better. Here are the seven ways to postpone your funeral. Seven secret tips to postpone your funeral. Best food, routine exercise, healthy relationships, total abstinence, I'll explain that, water yourself, regular rest, and a faithful attitude. Now let's go through these one by one and I think you'll understand. All right, first of all, the best food. What was the original diet that God had outlined for people? 
The Bible tells us that in the very beginning, God had an ideal diet. You know, I bought a new Mazda a few years ago. And in the glove box of the Mazda is an owner's manual. And in order to find out how to take care of that car, I went and got the owner's manual from my Makita drill. And I used my Makita drill to figure out how to take care of my Mazda. Is that how it works? No, Mazda made it. I figure they know how to take care of it. They engineered it. They know every detail of that vehicle. Well, God made you. And in his word, he gives the idea and the plans about how you can have optimum life and health. What was the original diet that God designed for all humans? You read in Genesis 1, verse 29, and God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed and every tree whose fruit yields seed, and to you it shall be for food. After Adam and Eve sinned, what supplemental food did God add to their diet? It says, when they could no longer eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I'm sorry, no longer eat from the tree of life. The other trees were gotten them in trouble. <laughs> By the way, you notice that eating had something to do with the trouble we're in right now? Eating the wrong thing. What supplemental food did he add to their diet? He said, you will eat the herb of the field. So the original diet was fruits, grains, and nuts. This was the ideal diet. And by the way, you could do pretty well on that diet now. But something must have been missing that was in the tree of life. And so God, when he drove them from the garden, he said, you shall also eat the herb of the field. That would be vegetables. Now, do you know how to tell the difference between a fruit and a vegetable? Let me give you a little quiz. I haven't started yet. Let me give you the quiz. <laughs> so, squash, fruit or vegetable? It's a fruit. I know they look like vegetables. Eggplant. It's an egg. No, it's, it's, <laughs> no, it's, it's a fruit. When you think about it. tomatoes, fruit. Bananas, fruit. Okay. Potato, a vegetable. Brussels sprouts, inedible. I just. So the, the key is very simple, that if it comes from, if it is the product of the flower, it's the fruit. And, you know, peanuts technically are not a nut, they're a bean. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. So from now on, tell your kids, would you like a bean and jelly sandwich? <laughs> and see how they respond to that. So, but God, you know, there's things, any part of the plant other than the product of the blossom is a vegetable. If it's the stalk like celery or if it's the leaves like spinach or if it's part of the root like a carrot or a potato, that's all vegetables. And the combination of fruits, grains, and nuts and vegetables is the ideal diet. Now I know we're going to talk a little bit about meat in just a moment, give you a personal testimony. Uh, I'm a vegan vegetarian. I try not to be radical, but I do promote that because when I finally, I was a vegetarian for years. But when I finally went the extra step over into being a vegan vegetarian, for the first time in my life, I was able to breathe freely without being congested. And I was over 50. I never knew that I didn't know what it was like to breathe. I would never go back now. Once I, I gave up the, um, the, the dairy products, I just felt so much better. Now, I'm, I'm not, again, it's, this is not a salvation issue. I'm just telling you. The jury is in, and you will do better on a vegan diet. Went to the doctor not too long ago. He did my blood work and my blood pressure, and the doctor didn't know me. The new doctor, he said, are you a vegan? I said, yes, why do you ask? <laughs> and he said, well, your, your blood pressure is like a teenager. He said, your, your stats are very good. And I said, yeah, you know, I've been a vegetarian for years, and I adopted veganism about uh, eight or ten years ago. I didn't grow up that way. I grew up eating everything that moved. I mean, I, I used to go out and eat escargot, snails, frog's legs, turtle steak. I've eaten rattlesnake, of course, all the meats. I had a company for a little while. It's called Doug Bachelor's Wholesale Prime Beef Steaks. I'd buy sections of beef, I'd butcher them, and I'd sell them, wrap them up. and. Um, I learned things in that business for the short time I did it 
that really helped me become a vegetarian. And uh, I, I have been now for 45 years, more than that. And I play racquetball with some guys. I see some of them out here, and they said, Doug, you run around like Wiley B. Coyote. No, the roadrunner. <laughs> I said, you're jumping and diving for the ball? How do you do that? I said, well, I shouldn't do it anymore. But, uh, and then one of the other guys answered. He said, he lives clean. And so it does make a difference in how you feel. Uh, a vegetarian diet is the ideal. The Bible says, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. I don't know if uh, you know that Venus Williams, she came down with an autoimmune disease several years ago. She was told that a vegan diet would help her. She felt so much better. Her sister, Serena, adopted the diet. They're both vegans. We were just in Melbourne or Australia about a month ago, and Joykovic won the Australian Open. He is a vegan. Mike Tyson, not that he's our role model, he just <laughs> adopted veganism. And I could just go down the list of people are discovering how much better either being a vegetarian or being a vegan is going to the diet God designed for humans. Are the laws about clean and unclean animals part of Moses' ceremonial law that's only for Jews? Now, if you're going to eat meat, the Bible's pretty clear, you should eat the meats that are classified as the clean meats. And I'll tell you very quickly, the, there's three rules that you use to know if it's a meat, how do you know what's clean and what's unclean? For the am animals, if it had a cloven hoof and it chewed the cud, it needed both criteria, it was considered clean. Like a cow or a sheep or a deer, they got the cloven hoof and they chewed the cud. You know what I mean? They, you see them sit down when they're resting. They're under the tree with their eyes closed. and they're <laughs> They got several stomachs to process this grain. And when they get bored, they bring something up from earlier and they chew it a little more and swallow it again. <laughs> and I don't recommend you try that. But uh, So that's, they chew the cud and they got a cloven hoof. That's, if they have both those things, they're clean. Now, there are animals that chew the cud like a camel, but it doesn't have a cloven hoof. And they're unclean. That's why Jesus mocked the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees. He said, you strain your water to get the gnats out, but then you eat camel. And that's become a famous proverb, straining a gnat and swallowing a camel. The other animal that has a cloven hoof, but it doesn't chew the cud, is a pig. But I'll get to him later. For the fish, it needed two criteria. It needed to have fins and scales. In the ocean and in the sea, it needed both those things, fins and scales. Not just fins, not just scales. It needed both criteria for it to be clean. That would mean that sharks are unclean. Catfish that they live around the sewer, they do not have scales, they are unclean. And there are some fish that have scales and no fins, they're unclean. And the shellfish, crabs, lobsters, I heard somebody say backstage yesterday that they said, lobsters, they're like underwater cockroaches. <laughs> it is sort of like a combination between a scorpion and a cockroach that they eat carrion underwater, they're scavengers. And so the shellfish, they are on the bottom. They, they are basically the garbage cans. You don't eat them. And then when it came to birds, it's a little more ambiguous, but the birds that are clean are what you would call the foraging birds. These are the birds that go around, they peck like the, the dove and the quail and the turkey and the chicken, and those were clean. The other birds were considered unclean. You're not supposed to eat buzzard. You're not supposed to eat hawks and uh, the raptors in these birds. So, but if you're going to eat the meat, you need to eat the clean ones. Some are going to say, Pastor Doug, that's just a law for Jews. That's a ceremonial law. Let's find out if the Bible supports that. What did God say to Noah? Genesis 7, 1 and 2. Come into the ark, you and all of your household. You will take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female. And so you notice he says the clean animals didn't go two by two. They went how? By sevens. And right after the flood, Noah offers sacrifice. What did he offer? Only offer a clean animal to God. If you wanted to offend the God of the Bible, you would offer a pig or an unclean animal. That's what the Greek king Antiochus Epiphanes did to outrage the Jews. Read on in Genesis 7, verse 2. Two of each of the animals that are unclean. Now, what does he mean, clean and unclean? Does that mean some of these animals bathe more than the others? It's about unclean for food. And so if you're going to eat meat, you want to stick to the clean meats, and I think everyone knows the jury is in, don't eat a lot of meat, uh, because animal products do carry disease, 
you can't catch a cold from a plant. Do you know that an animal at the zoo can catch a cold from you and you can get sick from animals? Now look what happened after the flood. All the vegetation is destroyed and eating animals became more common. And you could look at the lifespan of like Seth, 912 years. Methuselah, we all know, he lived 969. Noah lived 950 years. And look at how the ages of man just drops precipitously after the flood when meat eating became more common. Furthermore, in the Bible, it says if you're going to eat meat, there's a certain way it should be eaten. It should be butchered in a kosher way so there's no fat and no blood. Leviticus 3.17, by the way, this is not just Old Testament. You read it in Acts chapter 15 as well. So you shall not eat things that are strangled or with blood. This shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations. Perpetual. You shall eat neither fat nor blood. Diseases and stuff can be stored in the fat and disease can be transferred by blood. An interesting study someone did regarding the Maasai people that live in Africa. They take care of cattle and they get a lot of exercise, a lot of fresh air, a lot of sunshine, but they do eat fat, a lot of meat, and they actually drink blood. And they have extensive heart disease. Even though they're extremely active, the average Maasai man life expectancy of 42 years, the women 45 years. Sort of tragic. So these things do make a difference. God knows what he's talking about. All right, point number two. We're moving right along. What's another key to postpone your funeral? Routine exercise. Be in a, a good, regular exercise program. Kaiser Permanente did a study that shows that exercise is associated with lower rates of hospitalization and death after infection, regardless of your race or chronic conditions. That's December 15, 2020, a recent study. Exercise will help postpone heart disease. It strengthens your bones. It helps prevent um, a number of different kinds of cancers. Of course, it prevents the breaking of bones. And uh, it's a good idea to exercise where you get your heart going. It basically, you know, at the end of summer in the city, a lot of dust builds up on the road and you get uh, debris. And you say that every now and then you need what they call a gully washer. A storm comes through, it rains real hard, it cleans the streets, it cleans the airs, and it cleans out the gutters. Oh, your body needs a daily gully washer. And what happens is you run around, you get your heart pumping, and it flushes any of the debris and the toxins and stuff that might be stored there. It helps flush all that out, and then God's design where you've got kidneys and liver and pancreas and these filters in your body that then clean things out. But what gets the process going is you've got to get your heart going. You've got to get your blood pumping. You've got to get your lungs breathing. Increase your lung capacity. I think we all know having just come through the, the pandemic, they said people who regularly exercise that had good lung capacity, much, much higher rate of survival. Routine exercise. Was activity part of God's original plan for humanity? What does the Bible say? In the beginning, God made man, even before sin, God didn't make you to be a couch potato. The Lord took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. We are made for activity. If we're not active, we suffer. For years, uh, Karen and I had a little airplane, and we had a cabin up in the hills. We'd fly the airplane up to the hangar in Round Valley where we kept a pickup truck. And the pickup truck would normally run fine, but sometimes we would, we'd only get up there, you know, four or five times a year and had all kinds of problems with that truck that were related to its sitting. We'd get there and there'd be a mouse in the truck. And then you get the ventilation system. And then the bearings, because they sit, they start rusting on one side. The tires actually get flat on one side when they don't roll. You get water through D, what do you call it, uh, con condensation. Water develops in the gas tank. And then you have problems and all these things happen. And you know what? Those machines were made to run. And if you just park it and try to start it a year later, the data battery's dead. You have all kinds of problems. God made your body for activity. And if you're just sitting all the time, you're going to end up having problems with your radiator and your 
oil system and all kinds of things. So you got to stay active. God wants us to exercise. Even after sin, did God want man to exercise? Yeah. Genesis 3.19, God said, in the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground. You notice he said you're going to keep working until you die. God, well, how many of you would like to keep working until you die? You know, this message really impressed me because when I became a Christian, and in case you don't know, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I was living in a small town up in the hills, and I was probably one of the youngest people in the church. There were all these old people that moved up there to retire, and I was amazed that they were active till the end of their lives. They literally would fall over in the garden at, you know, like 100 years of age. And they were active, and their minds were clear, and they were busy, and they were working. I thought, well, yeah, there's really something to this that they've been teaching me and preaching to me about uh, staying active and getting your exercise. A little amazing fact I'll share with you. A couple in Australia, Jeanette and Alan Murray, she had helped to overcome breast cancer by adopting a vegan diet. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't use other methods as well, but this really helped her. And to promote that, she and her husband got an idea. They decided to run a marathon every day. This started in 2013. For 365 days, marathon, you know, like 26, 27 miles, and they ran completely around the continent of Australia. They entered the Guinness Book of World Records for the most consecutive marathons, and just for good measure, when they finished on January 1, they went to Tasmania, they ran one more marathon around Tasmania. She was 62, and he's 65. And all along the way, they ate a lot of bananas. A lot of, all, all the whole time, a vegan diet. And to have that kind of health. Not only do you need to exercise, I'm just throwing in for free. If you're going to exercise, try and get some of it outdoors. I go to a gym and I work out, but it's really nice if you can get outside. To those of you who fear my name, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. God wants us to get fresh air and sunshine. There's something about being outdoors. God made Adam and Eve, and he put them in a garden. He did not put them in a condominium. He put them outdoors where they could get the fresh air and the sunshine. And uh, the Bible says, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of his son Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. There's something healing about light. And so uh, try to get some vitamin D and some exercise outside. Another important point to uh, health is healthy relationships. People were made originally to be social creatures. And they've done a lot of studies that show that people that have good relationships tend to live longer. More so with men than women, but they've shown that married men live as much as five years longer. There's a lot of theories about that. Why is that? Some think it's because their wives nag them to get exercise. <laughs> Some think it's because when they're married, they don't take as many risks. But it, it is a fact that some of you are here, you're, you're saying, well, what about me? Relationships, it doesn't just have to be marriage. You need a good social support group. When people have good relationships and you've got a support group around you, it helps prevent bad habits. It gives you accountability. It helps you feel like you're part of something. It makes your mind more active. You know, the Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man does the countenance of his friend. When we debate things and we talk together, we sharpen each other. Keeps your minds active. They find people that are in even retirement facilities that have a good support group. They're able to help forestall uh, dementia and Alzheimer's longer because they're interacting in that way. The Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. So in the King James Version, it says, God made a help meet for him. And that doesn't mean help meet expenses. <laughs> God made a wife because we need relationships like that. And it, it also says that um, people who are married are less likely to drink and smoke. And um, part of going to a church, people that attend church live longer. Did you know that? 
Yeah, talking about secrets of how you can live longer. Because we get community. There's relationships. People watch out for someone. They say, I haven't seen this person. They check on them maybe. And they say, oh, they need help. They visit in the hospital. They pray for each other. All right, so we need healthy relationships. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 19, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? The one might be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Just finished reading a book, and it's uh, called The Watchmakers. It's about some brothers that survived the concentration camps in Germany in horrific conditions, and one reason they su survived is they had each other. At one point, when they were being marched from one camp to another in the middle of a German winter and everyone around them was freezing, the brothers said, let's hug each other. And they stood up and they embraced and hugged each other to gather warmth, and they stayed alive through the night when the others around them froze and died. And, and that's sort of a crude illustration, but it helps, it's a true story, helps illustrate that we need to hug each other, and <laughs> we need to have relationships. Hugging's good, too. All right. Number four, total abstinence. One of the keys to having a long life is you've got to know how to say no. Total abstinence, some things, you need a moratorium on some things. Uh, I know that if you talk to um, some of the doctors and the, the studies, they'll say, well, don't drink irresponsibly. Well, they've done some research and there is no responsible way to drink. The, the downside of drinking far outweighs any benefit you might get from a little red wine. And I understand that the benefit of red wine has nothing to do with the alcohol. It's the grape uh, skin in the red grapes. I had red grapes for breakfast this morning, and I'm still sober. So, <laughs> yeah, so you can get those benefits, have total abstinence in a couple of areas. One is alcohol. I grew up with a mother and a father that drank quite a bit. Uh, just causes all kinds of problems in the family. The Bible says wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. Whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Again, alcohol is addictive. It destroys brain cells. It dramatically affects our ability to reason. Um, alcohol is bad news. You know, over 50% of the people that went to the emergency room last night in Sacramento, alcohol was connected, either from fights or injuries or accidents or disease related to alcohol. Over 50% of the calls that the police got yesterday were from domestic abuse and alcohol is involved. More than 50% of the people who are homeless, alcohol is involved. You think about, I think more than half the people that suffer birth defects can be traced to alcohol. This is my little 50% tirade. Why would you want to support something that causes over half of the misery? Go to a prison. Over half the people that are in prison are there because of crimes committed while under the influence of alcohol. And then I meet Christians and they say, well, didn't Jesus turn the water into wine? And isn't a little wine good for your stomach? Well, the word wine that's being used here is the word grape juice. It's the same exact word. They didn't use the word grape juice in the Bible. Jesus did not turn water into booze. Jesus turned water into beautiful grape juice. You could get fermented alcohol all year long in Israel. He somehow at this wedding feast, probably even out of season, provided harvest grapes in the spring with his fresh wine. Save the best for last. Jesus, even at the Last Supper, he said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it with you new in my Father's kingdom. What he had there at the Last Supper was new wine that is unfermented. The Bible says as the new wine is in the cluster, if it's in the cluster, is it fermented? No. Jesus called his gospel new wine. He said, you don't put the new wine in the old wineskins because fermentation will take place. It is fresh. Christians should not drink any alcohol. The Bible says that Noah drank, he got drunk, and his, some of his family were cursed in the process. Lot was made drunk by his daughters and he committed incest. The record of drinking in the Bible is not a good one. So that's total abstinence.
moratorium. As uh, Nancy Reagan said, just say no. People who say, well, I think I can just drink a little bit moderately. One out of seven to one out of ten people that drinks becomes a problem drinker and brings all kinds of addiction and misery into their lives, not to mention the waste. Would you have a dog that bit one out of seven people that came to your house? So you want to stay away from it. The second thing that we should just say no is tobacco in all of its forms. Whether you're smoking it, whether you're chewing it, whether you're vaping it. Now, friends, I am speaking to you as somebody that used to drink. I'm speaking to you as someone that used to smoke. I know the pros and the cons. And um, it was hard for me to quit smoking. Actually, quitting smoking is not hard. I did it a hundred times. The hard part was staying quit, right? That's a, by the way, I borrowed that from Mark Twain. The hard part is staying quit. Praise God, I did stay quit. But um, mother smoked, grandfather smoked, father smoked. They all quit. And it was a struggle. And it's a very expensive addiction. Smoking is probably the um, leading cause of preventable disease worldwide. It's amazing how many people are in the hospital. I told you what we could do to turn around the health crisis if people would just do some of these basic things. A lot of it is self-induced. Smoking is not good. Now this last one in my total abstinence category is the reason the unclean foods are called unclean foods is because they are unclean. Do you know why they call pigs pigs? Because they're pigs. <laughs> they are unclean. I had a neighbor that used to ask me to feed his pigs. And all I can tell you, friends, is I can't find a better word than to tell you that they're pigs. <laughs> they will eat anything. Now, pigs are smart. You know, they say they're the smartest dogs. I wouldn't eat my dog either. I've seen what my dog eats. And they're scavengers. In the Bible, it often compares pigs and dogs together. It says, you do not give that which is holy to the dogs and do not cast your pearls before swine as a pig that is washed and returns to wallowing in the filth or the dog that returns to its vomit is a person that returns to his sin. And so you'll often find that dogs and pigs are in the same category because they're scavengers. They are not meant to be food. I finished a book this week, yesterday, about a man that was captured, lived nine years among Comanche Indians. An incredible story. I think it's called Nine Years Among the Indians. True story. Herman Lehman. He was living with the Comanches. A Comanche would eat almost anything. They would eat almost any part of any animal. They'd eat rattlesnakes. Hungry enough, they'd kill them. They knew how to kill a skunk and eat it. They would not eat pigs. And they were disgusted that pale faces would eat pigs. Isn't that interesting? You do with that what you want. I just learned it yesterday. <laughs> it says in The Guardian, March 2018, yes, bacon is killing us. Processed meat is now in a group of 120 proven carcinogens alongside alcohol, asbestos, and tobacco, leading to a great many headlines that are blaring that bacon is as deadly as smoking. So stay away from the foods the Bible identifies as unclean. The principal one in our culture would be the pigs and then the, the, the shellfish that are scavengers. We actually had a president who died from eating contaminated shellfish. I can't remember his name offhand. All right. The Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, Daniel and his three friends, they were brought to the Babylonian court and they said, we're going to let you eat from the royal cafeteria, but, um, and then you'll train in as counselors and wise men in the king's court, and it was a great privilege for them to be fed from the Babylonian cafeteria. But they realized that on the menu there was food and drink that God had said they should not eat or drink. The Bible says Daniel and his friends purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies or the wine which he drank. The very first chapter in this prophetic book of Daniel says that Daniel had a determination not to eat certain things and drink certain things. Then you get to the end of chapter 1. It says the king examined Daniel and his friends who said we want a vegetarian diet and water to drink. The king examined them and found out that they were ten times wiser than any of the other wise men in his kingdom. The end of the book says, the end of that chapter says, and Daniel continued until the reign of King Cyrus, meaning 
If Daniel was about 17 when he was taken captive, Daniel lived to 100 years of age at least. And he was still working. You read in Daniel chapter 6, he's an old man now under, uh, during the time of King Darius. And he is still the prime minister of the kingdom, managing the biggest kingdom in the world. And he's got to be like 88 or 90 years of age at that point. A longer, stronger life. You want to die like Moses, right? Be active and busy till the end. All right, point number five. Water yourself in several ways. You are mostly water. In the very beginning, you find water in the beginning of the Bible. God separated the waters from the waters. You go to the end of the Bible. It says, whoever is a thirst, let him come and take the waters of life freely. Talks about God in the beginning. These four rivers came out from the Garden of Eden. Crystal clear water like that which will flow from the throne of God. Uh, I hope I'm making you all thirsty thinking about this. Clear water. Uh, a lot of people are dehydrated. I heard a story years ago in Saudi Arabia. They discovered this uh, pile of bones. An individual evidently died. They were hiking across the desert. They got lost. Finally, when they realized they couldn't go on any longer, they tried to pitch some little tent for themselves, a little shelter, and by the bones in the tattered clothes, they found a note. And the man said, I've gone as far as I can go. I am dying from thirst. I cannot go any farther. They found his remains about 150 yards from a beautiful oasis flowing with water. That's kind of tragic. But you know, there's a lot of people that are dying of dehydration when they're surrounded by water in our culture. Most of us don't drink until we're thirsty, and that's because you're already dehydrated. You need to water yourself even when you're not thirsty. Pretend that every day you're going to cross a desert, and you want to store up like a camel before you go. Drink lots of water. And I know there's side effects to that. You don't want to be too far from the facilities when that happens. I know if I'm going on a long plane ride, I got a, got a ration how much you drink. <laughs> Could get to turbulence and they don't let you get up. But um, you need, otherwise you need to be drinking an abundance of water because every cell in your body is cleansed by water. And we need to be um, hydrating ourselves. Mayo Clinic says that um, we're between 60 and 70 percent of water in our bodies. Um, you lose water, of course, through perspiration, through evaporation, through elimination, urination, and uh, you need to replace that. You get some liquid through the food that you eat, but, and, and by the way, drinking soda pop does not qualify as hydrating yourself. And when you drink caffeinated drinks, do you know that actually makes you, uh, many caffeinated drinks are diuretics that make you lose water. It can actually be a net neutral effect. So you have to be drinking water itself. Drinking soda pop is like uh, liquid candy. Clear water. How much do you need? They say approximately two liters or half a gallon a day. A little more for men. You've probably heard the rule eight by eight. You need about eight ounces of water eight times a day. And uh, if the climate is dry and hot, you need a little more. And so you just compensate for that. Uh, when we're talking about water, you also want to be dealing with um, water in cleansing. By the way, some scriptures on this. Proverbs 5, verse 15, drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. The Bible says drink water. Water in the inside, we need water on the outside. Water is the very best solvent for cleansing your body. Washing the body and clothing prevents disease. You know, they found out that people that practice good hygiene live longer. It's a fact. Then I'll sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. Ezekiel 36, verse 25. Swimming. Swimming is actually a good exercise if you're able to swim. Now, it'll shorten your life if you're not able. But if you're able to swim, it's just one of the best uh, exercises out there for moving all of your muscles without a lot of impact problems. And so being in the water, drinking water, washing with water, brushing your teeth. Those, they found out that people that brush their teeth live longer. I told you I was going to give you some secrets about how to live longer. 
the bacteria that is plaque forming that is in your gums is similar to some of the same bacteria that clogs arteries. They're seeing a big connection with people that have good dental health and good heart health. I don't know if that's because people that have bad dental health just don't eat right. And people that have better dental health also eat better. But there is a connection there. And if you brush your teeth, you'll have better relationships <laughs> as well. Well, that's side benefits. Better chance of finding that spouse that will help you live longer. <laughs> Regular rest is the section we're talking about here. This is part of God's plan as well. Uh, especially in the culture we're living in today. Was a scheduled rest part of God's original plan for humanity? Yes, it was. It says, And on the seventh day God ended His work which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had done, and God blessed the seventh day. God maintains that we ought to have regular rest. God planned not, The Bible says God rested. Then He made man in His image. And then one of the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment, says remember to keep the Sabbath. God says we need to take a break and cease from our regular work and come together and be recharged on a regular basis. And the best time schedule for that day of rest is one out of seven. I understand in France they tried to make a ten-day week and the U.S. military tried to get the soldiers to go on a five-day week so they could get um, uh, different schedules going and Everything fell apart. They found the best schedule for the human body was to rest one day in seven. That's why God says the seventh day. All of the leading killers in society, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, all these things are connected with stress. The, the number of medicines that fly off the shelf connected with stress, everything from antacids to sedatives, uh, it's, I think, like 40% of the medicines that are sold are dealing with stress-related illness. God has a formula in His Word, and it's called, we've got to know how to rest. And it's not only resting once a week. You need to get a good night's sleep. And uh, they say that the ideal is people that don't sleep between um, six and eight hours a night have shorter lives. Also, there's a, there's a sweet spot. Those who sleep too much and those that are sleeping like nine, ten hours, you know, in the, in the babies, that's a different story. They're supposed to sleep more. But those who are sleeping like nine and ten hours, their lifespans are shorter too, and they're more connected with obesity. So the prime time you want to shoot for is getting six to eight hours of good sleep every night. And uh, if there are things that uh, are interfering with that, there's some good websites you can go to and find out how you can have a better night's sleep. 65% higher death rate for people who sleep less than five hours a night. Eating large meals before you go to sleep doesn't help any. And inadequate sleep has a profound effect on the risks in obesity of American women in particular revealed that women who slept less than five hours had up to 58% greater risk of weight gain and obesity. And again concluded the study between seven and eight hours had the lowest risk for major weight gain. So we also need nightly rest. We need the uh, weekly rest. I've got a uh, picture on the screen, and this is a cover from National Geographic 2005. It was an article that was called The Blue Zones. It took off, became so popular that several books have been written on it. A man simply went around the world and he did some research on what groups of people around the world live the longest. And over in Italy or in the Mediterranean, they had the people of Sardinia. Very common for them to live to 100 years of age. And then they went to Okinawa and they found the people there, very common. That was another group, had uh, long lives. And there was only one group in North America. And it was in Loma Linda. And it was a group of Seventh-day Adventists. Of course, Seventh-day Adventists are all over the country, but there's a large concentration because of the hospital down there and the schools down there. And so they found there's an awful lot of people down here that live over 100 years of age. Part of that, they say, is connected with their habit of weekly rest following many of the principles we're sharing with you. There is one long living group stateside. It's the Seventh-day Adventists who live an average of 10 years longer than the average life expectancy of about 79 years. How many of you would like to add 10 years to your life? 
not only do they live longer, they're active longer. And, and I'll say something just as a, uh, a little encouragement to those who may be admins that are listening. The statistics would be a whole lot better if we would practice what we know. These statistics go across the board with people that say they're Seventh-day Adventists, but there's a lot of Seventh-day Adventists that aren't practicing what the Bible teaches about good health. If they did, the numbers would be through the roof, as they say, if we practice those things. Now, this is hot off the press. Someone emailed this to me last night. What's the date on this slide? This is an article called The Economist from a magazine, a very, uh, fairly popular, well-established magazine, and uh, they are not a religious group. This just, what does that say? February 19. What's the date today? 25th. Would you say this is fresh information? Christian Californians may have a solution to America's obesity. Lessons in longevity from Seventh-day Adventists. And then it goes on. It starts talking about someone in the article uh, named Paul DeMazzo, who's 96 years old. I know Paul. We had him speak at our church. He's a friend of mine, 96 years old. But we can do better than that. We got a friend here I'd like to bring out. Dr. John, you, you got a moment? Come on now. Uh, Dr. John Scharfenberg, and he is a doctor. And when did you get your medical degree? 1948. You'll class, need to use this. Class of 48. See, when he started, they didn't use microphones. <laughs> <laughs> class of 1948. <laughs> And uh, now you've heard some of what I've been sharing about health. And are you vegetarian? Yes. You don't drink alcohol? No. Don't smoke? No. You don't chew? No. You don't go out with girls that do? <laughs> no. <laughs> you still have your driver's license? Yes. You all stay off the sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> you mind my asking, how old are you? Well, uh, Amer American way is 99. But Chinese way, it's 100. Can you say amen? <laughs> so I thought, you know, it's one thing for me to be telling you all these things. It's another thing if you can say, well, we got a living testimony who's a member of our church here, and he could be teaching everything that you've been hearing all weekend. As a matter of fact, we're going to do an interview in a few days and talk about these things. If you had just a word of encouragement for health for these people, what would you say? Well, take good care of yourself when you're young. You know, if I knew I was going to live this long, I probably would have taken better care of myself. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe it's possible by three different calculations to live to be 120. Amen. Most of us could do a lot better than we are. My son is predicting I will live to be 110. That's pretty good. <laughs> Amen. Can you give him a hand and say thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. John. Okay. We so appreciate so much you coming out. What did it say? Moses lived 120. And then God told him to climb a mountain, go to sleep. Having, number seven, a faithful attitude. Faith is crucial in health, and you will lengthen your life. Even in the AA program, one of the ingredients of AA is called trust in a higher power. They were having chronic alcoholism in Russia. They heard that the AA program was successful. They brought the leaders to Russia. They said, we'd like you to do your program, but they were communists then. They said, you got to leave this part about trusting a higher power out of your program. They said, we're getting back on the plane. They said, the program will not work without this part. So as we found, and we don't even completely understand it, we don't tell them who God is. I mean, most of the founders, it was the God of the Bible, but they said, we need to give God freedom because it's a public program. But they said, without trust in God, making these lifestyle changes and getting off alcohol is really tough. Getting off cigarettes. Is, they say cigarettes can be as tough as heroin. It's really tough. And you need help outside of yourself to do these things. A faithful attitude is talking about, it's not just what you eat, it's what's eating you. Sometimes people are bitter. And they don't forgive what does the Bible say about forgiving others as we want to be forgiven? We've got to learn to love and forgive people, even as God, for Christ's sake, forgives us. Be positive. Have a sense of humor. The Bible says, a merry heart does good like what? Like a medicine, meaning a medicine that's good for you. 
something that would be healing. They found out that uh, a review of 35 studies show that happy people may live 18% longer than their less happy counterparts. And this is from Med, uh, publicmed.gov, a government website. They did a study, and that's where your tax dollars are going. And they found out that happier people can live 18% longer than pessimistic people. God wants us to have a good outlook on life. So we're talking about some of the ways that you can postpone your funeral so that you could live a little longer in this life, right? But what good would it be to say, I want to live a little longer and I, I make it to 120? If you could live forever with a body that does not age, wouldn't that be better? And the Bible is talking about having a healthy, productive life now so you can know God's love and share God's love. You can have a productive life. But this life is not it. You know, death was never part of God's plan. Scientists cannot figure out, if you're young and you heal, why do you stop? When do you lose that ability to heal? Why do we age? It's a mystery. You know how much they're spending millions of dollars doing research to figure out how to reverse aging, and they keep hitting a wall to say, you might live to 120, but that seems to be all the human body can stand. Even if you follow all of the health rules, you'll eventually get old and you'll die. But that's not God's plan. God intended for man to live forever. And the greatest proof of this is that God so loved the world, he gave his son, brought his son into this world, that whoever believes in him might not perish but have what? Everlasting life and not in these bodies. The Bible says that we get glorified immortal bodies, bodies like Adam and Eve had before the light went out. And we'll be eating again. Revelation talks about how to get back to the garden and eat from the tree of life that we might live forever. This is God's plan for us, friends. He wants you to have that. Now, I know we've discussed a lot of things. It would be wonderful if this message would go around the world and people could make even half of the changes. You'd see the health care crisis just evaporate. It's a struggle sometimes. And I, I know. I used to drink. I used to smoke. Ate a lot of meat. I enjoyed it. Used drugs. And when Jesus got a hold of me, he said he would give me a new heart. And you know what? He changes your desires. And he helped me. It didn't happen all at once. He helped me make changes in my diet. He helped me give up the alcohol and give up the cigarettes. And that was one of the biggest struggles for me. And start practicing these things, start getting exercise and health and taking care of myself. And, you know, praise God. I got to be careful because I don't, <laughs> you don't want to... Uh, tempt the Lord, but my mother died at 57 from cancer. My father had cancer by the time he was 45. He, he lived longer, but um, praise God, I'm 66 next month. I don't have cancer. Uh, you know what? Genetically, I probably, I'm a candidate. That's what the doctors tell me. So one of the things you do in taking care of yourself is choose your ancestors very carefully. That is, a, that is a part of it that you need to do. But even if you are genetically disposed to certain illnesses by following the health practices, you will push back the clock on those things. And the trigger will not be pulled for years. You can postpone so many of those things that you may be genetically deposed to or have a proclivity for if you just follow these health principles. The Bible says in Ezekiel 11, 19 and 20, God says, I will give them one heart and I'll put a new spirit within them that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. You know what Jesus said? If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. People will come to a program like this and say, well, Pastor Doug, you shared a pretty tall order of some stuff and changes a person's going to make. How do we do that? I hope you won't walk away and forget. I hope you'll decide and say, you know, I'm going to try to incorporate some of these changes in my life. I want to have a longer, stronger life. I want to be more productive. I want to avoid disease and so much of the, uh, the medicines and the drugs that people live on the last few years of their lives so that I can have an optimum health. I hope you'll plan on coming for the rest of these presentations because we've got some great information that's going to be shared in our presentations this afternoon and by some great presenters. 
And uh, then we hope those of you who are watching spread these messages around. We would like people to be healthier. Amen? Amen.